Welcome to our second Too Close to Home for October, in which we'll be looking at some creepy locations and mysterious stories near the homes of our patrons at our Too Close to Home tier. So, CJ, D, Etienne, Cody and Joy, this one's for you. If you'd like us to dig up stories from your hometown, then don't forget to check out our Patreon for more information. And now, hit those lights, sit back, and enjoy. Wiley, Texas. Wiley is a city in the Collin County area of Texas, and is also the home of one of our much appreciated patrons, CJ. Texas covers a huge area and has a lot of ghosts, some of which we have covered in other videos. However, the one we're doing for CJ is a new one on us. It's known as Bailey's Light, and although it's not exactly on the doorstep of Wiley, it's only a few hours drive away. In 1818, James Britton Bailey traveled from North Carolina to Texas with his wife and six children. The family were part of Sam Houston's original 300, known as the first settlers in Texas. Bailey was known as Brit, and he and his family made their home near the banks of the river in Brazoria County. Brit was not a well-liked man. He was known as being argumentative, grumpy, stubborn, and eccentric, whose favorite thing in life was hunting, drinking, and getting into brawls. In fact, stories of his odd behavior are legendary in South Texas. On one occasion, a traveling preacher showed up on Brit's property looking for a place to stay for the night. Bailey flashed the preacher a dark smile and invited him in. He gave the preacher supper and lulled him into a false sense of security before suddenly pulling his shotgun from beneath the table. It became apparent the poor preacher needed to pay for his dinner and Brit could think of no better payment than to humiliate and terrorize his guest. By the end of the evening, the preacher was naked and dancing on a table, but it wasn't wine that made him dance, it was Brit shooting bullets near his toes. However, Brit, soon tired of the taunting, allowed the preacher to rest. But Bailey, who was by now drunk, had the tables turned on him when the preacher snatched his gun and ordered Bailey to also dance on the tables as he shot bullets near his feet. Without much choice, Bailey complied, but rather than get angry, the whole event struck him as funny and Bailey and the preacher became unlikely friends. After Bailey's death in 1832, he instructed his body to be buried with his rifle, his favorite pearl-handled pistols, his hunting knife, a jug of whiskey, and his favorite dog. He also requested to be buried standing up, facing north, under a large pecan tree. His loyal widow, Dorothy, saw it, that all his wishes were carried out, except the jug of whiskey. Dorothy, a religious woman, claimed that her husband had been intoxicated enough in life and would not greet St. Peter with whiskey on his breath, and so he was buried without it. In Texas, a man's dying wish is not to be taken lightly. To deny it is to call down the wrath of heaven itself and doom the soul whose wish it was to walk the earth for eternity. And that seems to be the case with Britt Bailey. Some years after his death, the Bailey house was bought by John and Anne Thomas, and it was she who first reported seeing Bailey's spirit. Anne never liked the house. She found it oppressive and creepy. Then one night in 1836, while her husband was away on a business trip, Anne awoke from a deep sleep, shaken and terrified. At the foot of her bed stood a dark shadow of a man. She screamed as the apparition approached her and covered her eyes with a blanket. When nothing happened, she peeked out of the blanket and saw the shadow at the door of her room. Again it moved towards her, she screamed again, and this time the apparition retreated and disappeared before reforming again next to the door. This continued throughout the night. The next morning, Anne told one of her workers about the incident and told her it was the spirit of Britt Bailey and her bedroom used to be where he slept. After the incident, Anne refused to sleep in that room again. When her husband returned, he was angry to find his wife moved out to their bedroom. He told her it was rubbish and he would spend the night in the room by himself. If Mr. Bailey did show up, he would gladly shake his hand. That night, a scream cut through the night air it was clear that there would be no handshaking, as the terrified man sat in his bed quaking, repeating that he too had been visited by the ghost of Britt Bailey. 
Although there have been reports since the shadowy apparition, the most common occurrence is the sighting of a large ball of white light that floats within the boundaries of Bailey's property. Many who have witnessed it have tried to follow it, but it eludes them by rapidly changing directions before soaring upwards into the trees of the Pecan Grove. One report was from a young man who was new to Brazoria County. One night, as he traveled on the road, he saw what he thought was a burglar's flashlight in a grove of trees. He stopped his car and went to investigate the strange glowing orb. As he approached, the bouncing ball of light stopped abruptly, then began to move towards him. The panic-stricken man spun on his heels and ran back to his car with the fiery light in pursuit. He made it into his car, only to find that it would not start. The engine crackled and sputtered, but he was unable to escape. To make matters worse, the ball of light began circling his car, pausing by his windows as if it were watching him. After a few moments, the ball of light backed away, then shot straight up into the trees above and disappeared. No sooner had the light disappeared, his engine roared to life and the terrified man sped away. When he arrived at his destination, shaken but otherwise unharmed, he phoned the police to tell them of the event. The voice on the other end of the line laughed and congratulated him, saying he just met the ghost of Britt Bailey. Known locally as Bailey's Light, it is a common occurrence for strangers to get chased by the glowing orb as it floats across the highway, causing several wrecks and even chasing a police car to the county line. And a historical marker sits near Bailey's grave to commemorate his life. Apart from the orb, it is said the apparition of Britt Bailey appears every seven years. The last sighting was in 2013, so he's due a visit this year. Jacksonville Jacksonville is the most populous city in Florida, and many believe the best place in Florida to live. Our patron D is lucky enough to live there, and for you, we are doing something a little different by looking at a creepy abandoned building. Public School Number 4 is an abandoned elementary school in Jacksonville, Florida. It was first established in 1918 as Riverside Grammar School. The building was constructed with poured concrete and was designed as one of the 12 fireproof schools built in response to the Great Fire of Jacksonville that took place in 1901. It originally overlooked Riverside Park until the construction of Interstate 95 and Interstate 10 completely isolating the school. Sometime in the 1950s, the name changed to Annie Little Public School after one of its principals. However, not long after, in 1960, the school was permanently closed to the public and was used for office space and storage. The building was sold in 1980 in hopes of renovating it for senior citizen apartments, although due to funding this was never completed. The building then lay vacant for over 20 years, falling into disrepair and a fire in 1995 caused the auditorium roof to cave in. In 1999, plans were put in place to convert the building into condominiums, but public outcry prevented this, and in 2000, the structure was designated a historic landmark. Today it's abandoned and has attracted numerous vandals, homeless people, and drug addicts, and graffiti covers much of the interior, and it's now known as the Devil's School. Over the years, various rumors have circulated about its past, and many believe the place is haunted. One of the most common stories is about a former janitor who preyed on pupils and tortured them in the boiler room before eating their body parts. Another tells of a killer principal who, after calling students to his office, they were never seen again. It's thought this rumor is partly true, as it was known in the past that there was an extremely strict and cruel principal running the school. Other legends suggest the school was built on an old Timaquan burial ground. This, however, has been proved false. Not only were no bodies found in the digging of the basement, but considering the high water table of the area, and how the legend does not align with the death rituals and traditions of any local tribes, it is not likely or believable. Another suggests the basement has a portal to hell, and there is another behind the stage. Others believe the place is riddled with paranormal activity due to psychic dust, a sort of psychic imprint that had been left as a result of years of energetic children. Although none of these tales have been proven true, the school is a magnet for ghost hunters and urban explorers, and some of the creepy footage recorded in the building 
shows just how dilapidated an area it is. Even the graffiti is creepy, with messages including upside down crucifixes, alluding to satanic practices. Nowadays, to keep people from trying to enter the building, a menacing six feet tall barbed wire fence surrounds the property. Not that that seems to stop the really determined. Victoria, BC, Canada. We have featured Victoria, BC before in a Too Close to Home episode. So Etiana, who also lives there, has suggested we look at the tale of Kanaka Pete in Newcastle Island. So sit back Etiana, this one's for you. In 1853, Pete Kaku left his home in Honolulu, Hawaii and traveled to Fort Vancouver. Over the next few years, he changed jobs and in the late 1860s ended up in Nanaimo where he took a job with the Vancouver Coal Company. Around this time, Kakua's Aboriginal common law wife, known as Mary, told him via her brother that she was leaving him and when he returned home on December 3rd, 1868, he found Mary, their young child, plus Mary's parents packing up her things. The next day, four bodies were found in Peter's home, but he was nowhere to be seen. A search was launched and he was soon found sitting beside a fire on Newcastle Island and on December 5th, 1868, he was arrested and charged with the murders of his wife, their infant daughter and his wife's parents. At the coroner's inquest, Pete willingly confessed to the murders and in a lengthy statement, he told how his wife had left him and he found out from her brother that she was not returning. After hearing the news, Pete began to drink heavily in a local bar he then went home at about midnight and found his wife, daughter and her parents collecting Mary's things. Pete said he left and continued to drink, eventually returning home again to find his wife in bed with her father. In a rage, Pete dragged the old man out of the bed and a fight broke out during which Pete had his finger bitten off. The old man called his wife who began beating Pete with a stick. So Pete grabbed the first thing he could, which happened to be an ax. He claimed he remembered nothing after that and woke up the next day to find his wife, daughter and in-laws all hacked to death. Pete pleaded not guilty to four counts of willful murder but was tried on two counts. On the first count, he was found guilty but mercy was recommended. The mercy recommendation was made on the grounds that Hawaiians are not Christians and killing men may not be such an offense in their eyes. On the second count, he was found guilty with no mercy the next day he was sentenced to be hanged. Despite petitions to get his death sentence commuted, Peter was hanged at Nanaimo at 7 a.m. on the morning of March 10th, 1869. It was reported at the time that he ascended the scaffold unflinchingly, made no remarks and struggled but slightly after the drop fell. His neck was evidently broken. Being of neither Caucasian nor First Nations descent, Kakua could not be buried in any of the city's cemeteries and was instead interred on his last place of freedom, the east side of Newcastle Island. However, unfortunately, Peter was still not allowed to rest and 30 years later, the Vancouver Coal Mining and Land Company unearthed Peter's coffin as they dug for a new coal mine. Peter was reburied in another unmarked grave for good. Today, the gory tale lives on in the form of ghost stories told around the fire by those camping on Newcastle Island. And there is a place known as Kanaka Bay, named after Kanaka Pete, as he is now known on the east side of Newcastle Island, off Nanaimo, Vancouver Island, British Columbia. The area is said to be haunted by the spirit of Pete, who is seeking revenge for his death sentence. There is even a sign up saying no camping beyond this point. And if you ask locals why, theories will tell you it's too dangerous to camp past the signs as the spirit of vengeful Pete lurks in the area. There is also a plaque that tells the story of Pete. Campers who have managed to spend a night in the area tell of terrified tales of scary noises and blood curdling screams followed by the sound of chopping. Some have also reported hearing a fierce demonic roar and the most eerie laughter. In 2012, a found footage type movie was released that was filmed on Newcastle Island called Severed Footage that touches on the link to Pete and his possible links to the true crime mystery of 12 severed feet in running shoes found on the shores of Western Canada.
Joy Homes, Dallas, Oregon. Oregon is the home place of our patron Joy Homes, and it's another place full of mystery and legend. Joy has lived all over the Oregon area, but has asked us to look specifically at the Dalles, a city in Wasco County, a place that is very close to where the Martin family disappeared in 1958. The Martin family lived in the Roseway neighborhood of Northeast Portland, and they were described by those who knew them as a very happy family. They were a family of six, consisting of Kenneth and Barbara, and their four children, Donald, Barbara, known as Barbie, Virginia and Susan, whose ages range between 28 and 11. Donald, the oldest child, no longer lived at home and was living in New York, where he worked in the US Navy. On the evening of December the 5th, 1958, Kenneth and Barbara spent the evening with friends and mentioned that the next day they were taking the family out to find greenery to make Christmas decorations. The following morning, as planned, Kenneth, Barbara and their three daughters climbed into Kenneth's 1954 cream and red Ford Country Squire station wagon and headed out to find the greenery they needed. Witnesses recall the family leaving around 1 p.m., which was strange as it was known that Kenneth did not like driving in the dark and it later questioned why they left so late. It's believed that the family were heading to the Columbia River Gorge, an area just outside the Dalles. At around 4 p.m., the family stopped at a gas station and then later ate at the Paradise Snack Bar in Hood River. This was the last confirmed sighting of the family. The following day, Kenneth failed to show up for work. This was so unusual that somebody contacted the police right away and when they searched the Martin home, it appeared that everything was just as the family had left it the day before. The police decided to trace the route the family had taken the day before. Police soon discovered that a stolen white Chevrolet had been recovered along the route the Martins had taken and police had arrested two men for the theft of the car. Both men had previously been in jail and had been in the same snack bar at the time the Martin family were there. However, strangely, police did not believe that they were involved in the disappearance and didn't investigate further. Also near the site of the stolen car, a passerby found a 38 Colt Commander handgun which had been thrown in the bushes and was covered in dried blood. The gun serial number was traced to a Meyer and Frank department store, and it was subsequently discovered that the gun had been among several items that the son Donald Martin had been accused of stealing while working at the store two years earlier. Donald was interviewed over the phone, and although he was in New York at the time of the disappearances, he was considered a suspect especially after family and friends reported that Donald had a strained relationship with his parents. It was also strange that at the time of his family's disappearance, Donald did not return home to join the search of his parents and siblings, and instead stayed at the New York Navy base. On December 28th, a woman's glove was also discovered in the same area, and it was confirmed by one of Barbara's friends that it was a glove she would wear, but it could not be proved the glove was actually hers. Police received several reports from people who said they saw the family in the Hood River area, however none of them could be verified. Then at the beginning of 1959, a search volunteer discovered a tire track leading off a cliff in the Dalles. Police were called to the scene and the tracks were analysed and it was concluded that the tracks were the same as the Martins family car. Further investigation also discovered flecks of paint that were known to be the same make and model of their vehicle. With this new lead, the police decided to lower the river by five feet and using sonar technology, they scanned over the river close to where the tracks were found. However, nothing was found and police were back to square one. The case went cold until May 1959 when a drilling rig in the river close to where the tracks were found locked onto something heavy. Work was halted while workers went to dislodge the object. However, by the time they got there, the object had dislodged itself and they saw two bundles of cloth drifting off down the river. Early the next morning, a fisherman and his wife noticed a body in the river at Cascade Locks. Police rushed to the river and located Susan's body. The next day, Virginia's body was found. Their cause of death was established as drowning. It was shortly after the discovery of the bodies that the sheriff of Hood County said that he believed the oil rig had overturned the Martins' car and dislodged the two girls' bodies 
and it was decided to search the area the rig had first encountered the weight, but again they turned up nothing. One of the final leads the police received was in 1961, when an anonymous individual wrote a letter to the Oregon Journal, stating that they had been parked with a companion when they saw the family's car travel under the railroad. Shortly after, they heard screaming and rushed to the scene, however when they got there, they found nothing. Over the years, many theories have been proposed about what happened to the Martin family. One of the most popular is that Kenneth and the family had been driving close to the Dalles, but as it grew darker, Kenneth found it hard to see and at some point lost control of the car and ended up driving over the cliffs and into the river. However, others believe foul play was involved, and those who analysed the tyre tracks determined that the tracks looked like the car had been deliberately pushed off the cliffs. The only person with a motive was Donald, and the fact the gun he had stolen was also found just reinforces that belief. To many it seems too much of a coincidence for the gun of the sun to turn up in the exact area the family was last sighted. As of today, Kenneth, Barbara and Barbie's bodies have not been found. The family car has also never been located, but is widely believed to be somewhere in the river. Until it can be found and recovered, the mystery of what happened to the Martin family will rumble on. In a sad side note, after the bodies of Susan and Virginia were found and cremated, their ashes remained at the Riverview Abbey Mausoleum in Portland, unclaimed for over a decade, until on December 30th, 1969, the urns were retrieved by an unknown individual. Weirton, West Virginia, USA. Weirton is a city in Brooke and Hancock counties in the US state of West Virginia. It's probably best known as the film location for Hollywood movies, such as The Deer Hunter and Reckless, as well as other smaller productions. But more importantly to us is the home of one of our patrons, Cody. We couldn't find too much on Weirton and Cody, although there are rumors that the historic Marland Heights Park and Margaret Manson Weir Memorial Pool is haunted and several visitors to the park have witnessed the same eyeless boy walking through the woods and the pool area is said to be haunted by the apparition of a man. However, the place that appears to have the most paranormal activity in Weirton is the Weirton Medical Center, where several ghosts have made their presence felt and employees and visitors to the center have experienced various strange phenomena. One common occurrence is that heart monitors seemingly keep beeping even though they aren't hooked up. Now it's not unusual for a heart monitor left unattended to beep to signal that it's been left on. However, the monitors at Weirton Medical Center are beeping in rhythm as if someone is still hooked up to them. Others have experienced shadowy apparitions in certain parts of the hospital and even people having their bums slapped when there is no one around. But the most common sighting is of a young woman in a pink dressing gown who's been witnessed in and around the operating theaters. It is said she is not malicious and is more of a prankster ghost who turns off lights or messes with radios and particularly likes to taunt the night cleaners. Some have witnessed strange mists hovering over tables and equipment being moved. Another common sighting is an apparition known as the Whistler, a man in work boots, jeans and a flannel shirt that hangs out in the laundry. It's speculated that he is a former employee of the old city dump on which the hospital now sits. He doesn't come around often, but makes his presence known by a faint whistle. However, perhaps the creepiest place in the hospital is the morgue, where years ago, a security guard recorded a voice saying help several times. After hearing the voice, the guard refused to go in the morgue alone and eventually quit. We'd love to get hold of that recording. Because we couldn't find too much on Weirton, we're going to feature a bonus area for you, Cody. It's not in Weirton, it's about 100 miles away in Weston, and we found it so creepy that we thought it was worth mentioning. It's the horrifying history of the trans Algony Lunatic Asylum. The trans Algony Lunatic Asylum is located deep in the heart of West Virginia, near the city of Weston. It's surrounded by extensive grounds and lush green lawns, and from the outside, it looks like a tranquil haven of peace and serenity. However, the story behind this former psychiatric hospital is anything but tranquil and turned into a horror story. The building was the brainchild of Thomas Story Kirkbride, a doctor and crusader for the mentally ill who founded what would become the American Psychiatric Association. 
Kirkbride sought to educate people about their misconceptions of mental illness. Namely, that it was a shadowy, irreversible condition best treated in darkness, with force and psychiatric restraint. He was seeking a more humane and effective plan of treatment for patients that included light and fresh air. The hospital was intended to be self-sufficient and a farm, dairy, waterworks and cemetery were also located on its grounds, which spanned 666 acres. After its completion in 1863, the grand building was renamed the West Virginia Hospital for the Insane and it welcomed its first patients in October 1864, although construction continued into 1881. It could house 250 patients, each with their own comfortable room. However, in less than 20 years, the ideology was over and due to an increase in mental health diagnosis and the stigma surrounding the disease, the trans Algany Lunatic Asylum found its tranquil facilities overrun, housing almost 500 patients more than it could accommodate. The hospital couldn't keep up and conditions began to decline dramatically. Patients were crammed together with sometimes four or five to a room intended for one. The farm and dairy on the grounds that was originally designed to provide for 300 was unable to meet the increased demand that came with overcrowding and patients began to suffer from malnutrition, which only exacerbated their mental health issues. By 1938, the trans Algany Lunatic Asylum was six times over capacity. The patients inside were running wild and orderlies were outnumbered and struggled to gain control. At its peak in the 1950s, the hospital was holding 2,600 patients, more than 10 times the number it was intended to house. Patients were found sleeping on the floor in freezing rooms with no furniture or heat. The overworked staff, neglected sanitation and the once bright clear windows were covered with dirt and human waste. Some of the uncontrollable patients were locked in cages in an attempt to make more room for less troublesome residents. Worse still, the asylum had become a training ground for experimental lobotomies, as Walter Freeman, the famous surgeon and lobotomy advocate, opened up shop. Freeman's infamous lobotomies often left perfectly healthy patients with lasting psychological and cognitive damage. His ice pick method, which involved slipping a thin, pointed rod like an ice pick into the patient's eye socket and using a hammer to force it to sever the connective tissue in the brain's prefrontal cortex, also resulted in a number of deaths. By the time the asylum closed in 1994, only one part of its grounds had been expanded to accommodate the new demand, the graveyard. Nowadays, the once ornate building sits abandoned, with some rooms still filled with medical equipment, wheelchairs and decrepit furniture, along within the many ghosts who are said to haunt the place. It seems the place is teeming with the souls of the past. There are numerous reports of a ball of light moving rapidly down the hallways, as well as the rumbling noise of hospital trolleys, as well as doors opening and closing by themselves. People often report the sound of someone or something banging on the metal pipes around the building, and hysterical laughter is heard coming from empty rooms. On the first floor is a ghost named Ruth, who was said to hate men while she was alive and used to throw things at them. Now in ghost form, Ruth is still apparently throwing things at male visitors. On the second floor, allegedly ghost hunters have recorded someone saying get out in Ward 2, where two patients committed suicide and another patient was stabbed to death. A ghost of a man named Big Jim is said to haunt the third floor, as well as a nurse named Elizabeth, and the ghost of a soldier named Jacob is said to haunt the fourth floor. But the most frequent and most famous ghost is that of a little girl named Lily. She's been seen wearing a white dress, playing in the hallways, often giggling to herself. It is thought Lily was born at the asylum and spent all of her young life there until she died aged about nine. Those who've witnessed her find her sweet, but very creepy. Since 2007, the trans Algany Lunatic Asylum has been open to the public for tours, allowing them to visit firsthand the shocking conditions the patients had to endure. It's also been featured on a number of well-known paranormal shows. If you haven't already been, I think this one's definitely worth a visit, Cody. So that's it for this episode of Too Close to Home. We hope you've enjoyed, and a big thank you to Joy, CJ, D. Etienne and Cody. Thanks for watching and supporting. As always, we'll see you in the next video.